Hi, everyone. Thank you all for being here today um, for our second um, uh, lecture in our Grand Round series in fall of 2021. Um, we are delighted to have Dr. John Jackson um, from Don Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health uh, here with us today. Dr. Jackson is an assistant professor in the departments of epidemiology, biostatistics, and mental health. And he's a core faculty member in the John Hopkins Center for Health Equity, Health Disparity Solutions, and Drug Safety and Effectiveness. His work primarily focuses on developing methodological tools uh, research and includes methods to identify high for interventions that address health disparities and methods to evaluate interventions and translate them to new populations and contexts. Um, his work has been funded uh, by NHLBI and um, John Hopkins, and today he's going to be talking, um, he's going to be sharing uh, his work around incorporating equity value judgments into the measurement and causal decomposition of racial and ethnic disparities in health and health care. Um, as a reminder, this is being recorded. Um, and Dr. Jackson, would you like us to hold questions to the end or for people to um, interrupt you with uh, clarifying questions? They can definitely interrupt. Okay. I'm, I'm happy to be interrupted. Okay. So if you guys have clarifying questions, um, as, as Dr. Jackson goes along, please raise your hand or use the um, question and answer function, um, and we'll get to those um, we'll get to those questions as they come in. So, without any further ado, I'll I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, um, and and uh, uh, Carrie or Ashley, I assume that you guys will help me see the questions. Yes. Or, or maybe okay, because I I tend to not really pay attention to uh, the, the questions all the time. Uh, so, uh, okay, let's see. All right, let's get the pointer together. Options, okay. All right, um, and the slides are working? Yep. Yeah. Okay, all right, uh, great. So um, thank you for, um, having uh, me here today, I'm, I'm very honored to uh, be able to present uh, my work with you and engage with uh, your uh, department uh, in this way. Um, uh, as uh, Carrie mentioned, I'm going to be talking about how we uh, incorporate equity value uh, judgments into how we both measure disparities and uh, use what I call causal decomposition analysis, uh, which is to try and understand which uh, factors uh, contribute uh, to disparities. Um, really the plan for today is to open up with a motivating example uh, to help sort of ground ideas. Uh, and then I wanna spend about half the time maybe talking about ethical issues and how we uh, define disparities and then talk about how these uh, issues uh, affect uh, the estimation process in uh, causal decomposition analysis, which is again, analysis to try to understand what factors we could use to try and uh, reduce uh, to reduce disparities. Um, the talk is gonna be mostly conceptual um, without a, a data application today, um, but hopefully the example is uh, grounded enough that uh, you can still follow along. Um, so uh, just as a, a plug, uh, much of what I'm gonna talk about today is actually covered uh, in this paper that which was recently published in Epidemiology in March. Um, admittedly, it's a very technical paper um, but uh, a lot of the ethical arguments that I make today and concepts are, are covered uh, within um, a portion of the paper right smack in the middle that doesn't have any equations um, and is highly accessible. So if you want to read more about those aspects, I um, would encourage you to read at least that portion of, 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 of the paper. Um, so let's go ahead and get started. So uh, we've known that there are been uh, uh, differences in outcomes for a long time and that these differences have been uh, uh, really concentrated um, among uh, marginalized groups, particularly racial, ethnic, and minorities, and um, uh, those of low socioeconomic status. Um, there are 
are many disparity uh, populations, um, particularly those defined by the NIH. Um, and uh, at least since the 1990s, they've explicitly been uh, in, you know, noted as uh, being part of our public health priorities to, uh, to address health disparities. Over time, we've really evolved from aiming to uh, make those uh, differences smaller um, to eventually eliminating them. And then more broadly trying to uh, create a society where um, everyone has uh, the, the, uh, the opportunity to reach their fullest um, uh, health possible, which is how some people define health, health equity. Uh, and so uh, we can see that over time, our, our um, understanding and goals for uh, health equity have uh, improved, especially when we think about how they've been conceptualized in the, in the healthy uh, people um, uh, framework and initiative. But when we think about, at least over the last 20 years, uh, how, how we've made progress in these areas, um, without going into uh, a lot of uh, research out of time, uh, we can see that in many areas, we still have a long way to go. Uh, we know that there are stark uh, disparities in both uh, cancer uh, incidence and, and uh, prognosis. Uh, we know that there are uh, uh, um, disparities in post-surgical um, outcomes and, um, and mortality. Um, and then more recently with the uh, COVID-19 pandemic, we know there were really stark uh, disparities in infection rates and in hospitalization and also in mortality. So um, even though this, you know, we've been aware of these things and had these as metrics in our, uh, our, our public health priorities and plans, uh, we still have uh, a way to go across many sectors in medicine and in public health. One uh, area where I think that is most striking to me is that of subclinical risk. Uh, so this is an example of subclinical risk for cardiovascular disease, looking at hypertension. Uh, these are data uh, recently, well, I guess published in the American Journal of Epidemiology, uh, looking at uh, data from um, the National Health and Nutrition Examination Survey um, from 1999 through 2016. And uh, these are um, showing you data for adults over the age of 64. Uh, you can see hypertension prevalence on your left, uh, awareness of hypertension uh, among those who have hypertension on the right. And um, the lines correspond to differ different racial and ethnic groups uh, with um, uh, non-Hispanic blacks and green, uh, um, non-Hispanic whites and blue, and uh, Hispanics in yellow, which hopefully you can you can see, and 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 so we see that over the last twenty or so years, uh, um, there is um, we don't see differences between non-Hispanic uh, whites and, um, and and Hispanics, but we see a really stark difference when we look at uh, non-Hispanic blacks. A twenty a twenty point difference that's really been stable over time and really hasn't changed. Uh, thankfully, when we look at awareness, we can see that gaps in awareness of hypertension, uh, which is important. Um, we see that these have um, really um, closed over time. Um, there's still some, uh, still some uh, uh, gaps uh, with, um, uh, with with Hispanics. Uh, and similarly for treatment, we can see that we we've, we've we we have to some degree closed treatment gaps. Um, but what's, what's really striking is when you look at those who are, are, are treated, we can see that um, we uh, have only partially closed gaps for Hispanics when compared to non-Hispanic whites. And uh, we haven't closed the gap at all for uh, non-Hispanic blacks, um, even though we've made great strides in um, improving uh, hypertension control rates among those who have been treated. Uh, and the reason why this is striking to me is because this is an area where we really uh, understand the epidemiology and have tools at our disposal um, to, uh, to make changes. Uh, uh, to, to put it bluntly, we know how to uh, reduce blood pressure. Uh, when we uh, look at the, uh, the American Heart Association, they've recommended the moniker of a Life Simple 7, 
uh, which is a, a set of non-pharmacological interventions from weight loss to healthy diet to um, uh, reducing sodium, increasing potassium, uh, being physically active, um, moderating alcohol intake. And each of these things um, shows clinically significant impacts on systolic blood pressure. Uh, and uh, we also have pharmacological interventions. Uh, so the American College of Cardiology has very detailed and extensive uh, treatment guidelines uh, that have um, different subclasses of medications stratified by uh, comorbidity. And, and the effects of these um, treatments that are available have been evaluated in large and rigorous randomized trials showing again, clinically meaningful impacts on systolic blood pressure. So this is an area we have multiple tools at, at our disposal. Um, unlike in some areas um, where there may not be many treatments available, there are a plethora of prevention and treatment options available. Um, and what's more striking to me is we actually have evidence that we can close gaps. So these, I'm showing you data from Kaiser uh, Permanente. Um, I'm not sure which uh, region um, these are from, I believe this is looking at the California data, uh, but they were showing that um, over the years from 2009 to 2014, they were able to um, close the gap from 8% to for about 4%. So the, the control rates um, for uh, whites is at the top and for blacks is um, on the bottom. Um, and you can see that um, over the time they were able to close the gap um, by uh, doing a series of um, contextual interventions, including team-oriented care, trust-building activities, uh, community engagement, and also educating providers, um, which shows that at least in some health systems, we, we are able to uh, close that gap that we saw um, at the national level. And so that's really going to be the motivating example today. Um, suppose um, you, you work in a healthcare system, so I'm based at Hopkins. You're at Vanderbilt. We might ask, um, you know, if we observe uh, racial uh, differences in hypertension control, uh, what policies or interventions could we do to, uh, to reduce those disparities or eliminate them? Um, in particular, uh, what uh, factors should those interventions, um, should, should they focus on? What targets should they uh, focus on? And so uh, to, to really answer this question, we could propose doing an uh, observational study uh, where we enroll patients, suppose, um, at, uh, at the time of a, 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 of a primary care visit, uh, retain those who have a prevalent hypertension within, uh, um, uh, recorded within the past six months. Um, we could assess covariates um, in the six months before the visit or, or at baseline, uh, and uh, we could assess uh, treatment decisions in the 14 days after the PCP visit. And we could look to see uh, whether or not hypertension was controlled uh, five to six months after the visit. And so uh, the visit would really start the clock for our time zero. Uh, and uh, the, 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 our exposure here is really treatment intensification and we could see whether or not that results in a hypertension control. Um, six months down the line. And, and, and our covariates, we could measure demographics, we could measure socioeconomic status, and also clinical uh, status, such as um, comorbidities like diabetes, chronic kidney disease, and uh, baseline blood pressure. And socioeconomic status could be things like education or, or, or type of insurance. Um, demographics could be, say, age and uh, sex or sex assigned at birth. Um, and when we think about these variables, um, how they're related um, in a causal sense, we could depict them on a graph, uh, which is shown at, at your right. Uh, and we could see um, why is our outcome hypertension control. And, and really, um, in this causal model, it's really uh, being impacted by everything. Uh, M is uh, treatment intensification. It's also impacted by all the covariates, um, in, including race. Um, and uh, to say more about our arrows, uh, some, of, some of the more subtle arrows. So I typically think of arrows going out of race as capturing effects of uh, interpersonal institutional discrimination. Um, but these arrows that link race to uh, socioeconomic status and demographics, I see that as um, a social demographic or historical and social cultural forces, including racism, uh, that, that really uh, link um, 
uh, early life experiences with uh, the, the racial group that one belongs to at, at birth. Um, uh, and and, um, and so these are sort of uh, demographic and um, social forces that sort of link uh, race to outcomes as well. Um, and um, so with, with all of that, you know, we can think about um, you know, we, we see these disparities, we want to do what's called causal decomposition analysis um, to, to try to identify factors that might be useful to intervene on to reduce disparities. And uh, causal decomposition analysis essentially asks a what if question. So if we observe um, hypertension control rates for Blacks, and so this is this top uh, picture here where we've got a population of, of Black persons and they are um, uh, receive uh, the treatment in, is intensified at a certain rate. Um, and um, that, that goes on to lead to a certain hypertension control rate. We could also observe hypertension control rate for white persons and, and we see that they um, are intensified at a certain rate and that goes on to have a hypertension control rate for them as well. Uh, we might ask um, what would happen if uh, blacks received uh, treatment intensification at the same rate as uh, whites. Um, and in this scenario, uh, what would the uh, uh, hypertension control rates uh, for Blacks be in this counterfactual scenario? And so with these three quantities, um, the observed hypertension control rate for Blacks, observed hypertension control rate for whites, and this counterfactual uh, or hypertension control rate for our Blacks, uh, where we've removed disparities in uh, treatment intensification, we can get three quantities that we might want to estimate. Um, I call these estimates. Um, so our observed disparity would be just really comparing observed outcomes uh, for Blacks versus observed outcomes for whites. Um, our reduced disparity compares the observed uh, uh, control rates for uh, Blacks um, compared to the counterfactual control rate for uh, Blacks under the scenario where we remove disparities in treatment intensification. And uh, the residual disparity, how much of the disparity would remain is um, contrasting this counterfactual scenario for Blacks compared to the observed scenario for whites. Um, and so that's, those are the three things that we might want to estimate, these three disparities. Is everyone with me so far? Okay, no questions? All right, awesome, great. Um, so, we have this thought experiment. We've got three disparities we want to estimate, but I think before going any further, we have to step back and ask, how do we actually think about disparity? How do we measure it? Um, in my field, epidemiology, um, often it, it has been assumed. I don't think it's true anymore, but um, or hopefully not as much anymore that often it's been assumed that a, a, a raw difference is um, synonymous with, with disparity. Um, but the bioethics literature is more clear. Um, and, and in public health, often we rely on um, a definition that was really developed by Paula Braveman, which was uh, uh, built on top of a lot of the work that was done at the World uh, Health Organization by um, um, Margaret Whitehead. Um, and, and this definition was actually used in the 2020 uh, Healthy People uh, report and, and was further uh, refined by uh, the secretary's advisor advisory committee for that report. Um, and, and they define disparity as a, um, as a difference that's systematic, um, avoidable, and one that adversely affects socially disadvantaged groups. Um, and uh, I'm pulling from the 2011 paper, there's a 2006 paper by Paula Braidman that really walks through why they crafted it that way. It's a really interesting read. Um, but one thing that they point out that I think is important is number one, I think that you know, it affects socially disadvantaged groups. So it's really centering marginalized groups here. Um, another thing that it's doing is that it's saying that you know, these differences may reflect social disadvantage, but we don't have to demonstrate causality to say that uh, these are disparate, these are unfair, that these are unjust. And I think that that's an important point. Um, and the, the, the support that they have there is that, you know, health is a resource that's uh, needed to um, 
you know, to, to obtain and secure resources and to live a good life. Um, and if you have a group that's uh, been traditionally marginalized in, in society and they're further disadvantaged on health, uh, we, we can look at that scenario as, as, as being unjust because it's an additional burden that's being placed on an already marginalized group. And by that fact alone, uh, we can see uh, a, a difference in, in this sense um, as unfair and unjust. And we don't need to demonstrate, say, the causal effect of socioeconomic status on outcomes or the causal effect of race on outcomes to say that things are unjust and, and unfair. And I think that's really important. Um, another uh, definition that uh, you are probably more familiar with, um, given that this is a health policy uh, department, um, is the Institute of Medicine's uh, definition, uh, which is now the National Academy of Medicine, but uh, they released a, a very influential report, Unequal Treatment, um, and they centered a disparity definition around um, what I would argue around clinical encounters with providers um, and really thinking about patient-centeredness and appropriateness of, of healthcare decisions. Uh, and so they said that a healthcare disparity is not due to differences in uh, access to care, clinical needs, or preferences to care. And I, I put asterisks by access to care and preferences to care because those are really sort of contingent on how one is examining the disparity, which I can say more about later. But um, just out of interest in time, I'm gonna move uh, forward. So there's this notion of what, in both definitions, you can think of, um, you know, certain differences being allowed to contribute to, to disparity and others being excluded from disparity. Um, and so um, there's this notion of uh, allowability, which has gone by different names in, 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 in other fields, but um, uh, um, Benjamin LeCook at, at all with, um, um, with Alan Zaslaski and I think Tom McGuire uh, really put forth this idea of allowability in the context of health services research um, generally speaking, uh, you know, when we think about um, uh, defining disparities for outcomes, we can think of allowable sources as uh, those that are fair sources of difference that we uh, would uh, not want uh, to contribute or, or, or that do not contribute to unjust difference, i.e. disparity that we would want to adjust our um, analysis for to take their contribution off the table. Non-allowable sources are those that are considered to be um, unfair sources of difference that do contribute to unjust difference, and ones that we would not want to adjust for uh, to keep their contribution on, on, on the table. Um, and I'm uh, saying um, outcome allowability here because now I'm really gonna talk about how we define disparities in our outcome, which is hypertension control. So, um, uh, in our example, you know, we 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 may see that race is associated with hypertension control. Uh, why? In uh, many different ways. We know that in clinical samples, blacks are often uh, younger and uh, have a higher proportion of females, which could predict uh, better hypertension control at the population level. Um, we know that blacks often have uh, higher rates of comorbidity and are often have lower SES which could lead to lower rates of hypertension control at the hypertension control, um, I'm sorry, sorry, at the population level. And so the question is, which of these differences should be captured in our uh, disparity measure? Uh, so to help me think through uh, this question, the answer to this question, I went to the bioethics literature and I saw two uh, themes really pop up. Um, about how to uh, decide what should be allowable versus non-allowable. And um, one thing that came up was this issue of manipulability. Uh, so um, in, in a lot of the early work, um, if you look at some of the old World Health Organization um, definitions of disparity, they, they really had this concept where factors that, a, that an actor had no control over might be considered allowable. So things like genes or um, things that people really couldn't change, and 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 there's uh, you know a there's a response to that or a counter to that, and that's really, um, you know, I call it I call it amenability to intervention, which says that even if you know these factors that we're thinking about are you know you really can't change them, but if we have technology or could develop technology that actually could address their effects, 
um, and, 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 and if these non-manipulable factors actually adversely affect socially marginalized groups, then um, we can think about uh, you know, these non-manipulable factors as um, contributing differences that are non-allowable, meaning that they're disparate because if we have ways to address their effects and we don't, uh, we can think about that as um, being inequitable. So uh, let's go through our, our covariates here. Uh, you know, should we consider demographics to be allowable? Well, we know that age usually predicts worse health outcomes. Uh, we know you can't really change your age. Um, and we know that it has addressable effects. Um, but the key is in most clinical samples, um, uh, 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 racial ethnic minorities, particularly the Blacks are often advantaged on age in the sense that they're younger. And so age differences wouldn't really contribute to the higher uh, um, rates of, um, or, 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 or the lower rates of hypertension control. Um, and so um, in this case, we could treat them as allowable and adjust, to, and adjust for them. Um, and, and an additional reason why we would want to do that is to avoid um, masking um, other uh, uh, sources of disparity that might be occurring through say socioeconomic status or comorbidity. Um, a really profound example has been the COVID-19 pandemic. Um, as, with most, as with most things, uh, there's, there was a, a study uh, the, the Open Safely study, which was um, uh, um, uh, published this year, uh, showing that uh, the crude um, ethnic uh, difference in um, mortality um, unadjusted was null. But once you adjusted for um, age and sex alone, you saw a twofold uh, difference with uh, mortality for ethnic minorities being higher. So um, there's a real danger of um, of masking disparity if, 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 if you don't adjust for non-manipulable non characters characteristics where the marginalized group is advantaged. Um, and so what about clinical status? Um, well, we know that uh, racial ethnic minorities or Blacks in, in this case have a higher prevalence. And so that can lead to um, uh, worse, worse outcomes. Um, you could argue whether or not at the point of care they're manipulable or not, but we do know that they have addressable effects. And again, uh, these are um, the pattern is such that Blacks are disadvantaged um, in terms of high, having higher comorbidity. And so in this case, I would argue that they could be treated as not allowable um, not to adjust, but they do contribute to disparity. And uh, for socioeconomic status, it's a similar argument. Again, Blacks, um, so, so low SES leads to worse hypertension control. Blacks have higher rates of low SES. Um, again, you could argue whether or not they're manipulable, but you know there are addressable effects when you think of um, increasing efforts to, to um, detect and um, social needs at the point of care and to link patients with uh, social supports or programs um, through uh, social work interventions. Uh, so there are ways to um, address effects of, of low SES um, with the hope of improving uh, health, health outcomes. So for all of these reasons, I would argue that they could be treated as non-allowable um, so that again, they do contribute to the disparity measure. Uh, a really um, interesting um, uh, principle uh, that, you know, uh, to think through is not just these ethical principles, but more broadly, how are disparity measures uh, that we're defining used in society? And so I sort of argue if you're working with a disparity measure that, um, uh, or you're defining one that is going to be used to set organizational incentives, uh, you would, would want to try to design it in such a way that it would uh, not actually um, in, um, uh, uh, in sort of induce disparities. And so the example I give in, in the paper is if you thought about uh, disparity as a performance metric, um, you know, if we were rating uh, um, organizations uh, based on the extent of disparities, um, um, within their institution um, such that, you know, uh, the higher the disparity, the lower the rating, and thus the less likelihood of receiving the incentive. Um, institutions in that sense would arguably be incentivized to do whatever they could to reduce the disparity measures, including avoiding complex patients um, who often come from marginalized communities. And, um, and, and so in that case, it could lead to deleterious um, effects by having um, complex patients there to other institutions. So in that case, 
um, if you're designing a disparity measure that you know could have um, effects like that, you might actually want to adjust for comorbidities um, in, in, in that case. And if you were actually studying that, um, if that was your measure that you were gonna do a, a decomposition analysis for, you would probably want to respect the fact that you needed to um, adjust for uh, causal decomposition analysis because that's really what's used in practice. So moving on to um, um, our definition now. So however we choose um, to define allowability, meaning you know, whether or not we choose um, demographics or SES or um, socioeconomic status or, um, or clinical factors as, as allowable or even nothing at all, um, I'm proposing that we um, really just use a simple measure of disparity, a standardized measure of disparity. So stratify the race specific uh, um, out, uh, outcome means by the allowables. Um, so you know you have the stratum specific weight for blacks, for whites, and then standardize them to a common distribution um, and then compare the standardized means. Um, and, and you can use uh, different distributions. I won't get into um, that here, but we could talk about that. Um, but really, the, the key point I want to make here is that this is a descriptive measure. Um, it's not a, really a causal effect of manipulating race or manipulating the perception of race. Um, it's not uh, um, a measure that's uh, looking at manipulating uh, uh, the allowables by intervention. Um, it's really just a simple uh, standardization of stratum specific. Uh, um, differences. Um, and I think that it's important that it's descriptive um, because uh, at least in my opinion, um, when, when you think about what a, a disparity measure um, is supposed to do or the role that it serves, it's really um, a tool for social justice, right? So it helps us understand that a problem is wrong. It motivates policy. It motivates interventions. Um, and uh, you know, when it's hard to measure, it's hard to actually uh, detect that a problem is wrong um, and, and actually move forward. So, you know, I think the COVID-19 uh, pandemic was a clear example of that. It wasn't until um, at least a few areas in the country had race stratified data and were able to show disparate weights uh, that, you know, there was a lot of attention directed towards that. Um, and so if we define disparity in causal terms, we have to think about confounding of race and confounding of the allowables and overlap assumptions and, um, and, and, and other technical assumptions. It can create um, an unnecessary barrier to actually even tracking whether or not things are wrong. And, and I think that this simple descriptive measure of disparity is, 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 is good enough and actually conceptually maps the definitions I had um, described earlier. So going back to our thought experiment here, um, again, you know, we have the observed hypertension control rate for blacks, observed hypertension control rate for whites, and we have this counterfactual scenario where we've removed disparities in hypertension control to get this counterfactual scenario for, um, for, for, for blacks, right? So we've got these three different control rates. If we think about what's going on there in our thought experiment, uh, we have our disparities and our outcomes, but we're also trying to remove disparities and in, in, in some intervention target, which in this case is treatment intensification. So we have, we have to ask ourselves again, well, how do we think about disparities in treatment? Um, and, um, you know, there's a lot of um, insight in the IOM definition and that, you know, thinking about clinical appropriateness. Again, they define disparities as in healthcare is those not due to access to care, clinical needs or preferences for care. Um, and and um, I'll talk about that in a second. Just as a reminder, um, allowable sources are those that we might consider to be fair, that don't, con uh, uh, that don't contribute to uh, disparity, ones that we would uh, want to adjust for. Um, not allowable sources are those that are unfair, that uh, do contribute to unjust difference that we would not want to directly adjust for. Uh, to keep their contribution on the table. Um, and, and here we can see that uh, race is associated or could be associated with treatment in many ways through demographic differences, through socioeconomic differences, and through um, uh, differences in comorbidity. And again, the question here is which of these differences should be treated as allowable, or here I call target allowable for defining 
uh, disparities in our target, which is treatment intensification. So stepping back and thinking about, um, you know, there were, they actually didn't really talk about this case in the bioethics literature a lot, um, much at all. Uh, really it was the health services literature and also thinking about examples from labor economics um, to think about how um, discrimination has been defined to really see that, um, at least in my mind, what was going on is that um, there's this idea of a social contract um, in that, you know, an idealized social contract where we might agree or could agree of, on a set of criteria that should ideally uh, govern how uh, a good, for example, medical treatment um, is distributed. And then those criteria could be considered as allowable. Um, meaning, and again, allowable, meaning that they would be adjusted for um, so that differences in those criteria don't get picked up in the disparity measure. Um, and so let's go through the examples to kind of put some, um, put some legs on this. So when we think about age and sex uh, differences, um, should we treat you know, demographics as, as allowable for the purposes of defining disparities in uh, treatment intensification? Uh, well, we know that most treatment guidelines do have age-specific uh, criteria or protocols, um, and that's because um, basically because of because of the physiology um, can depend on both age and um, sex assigned at birth, and, um, um, and 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 for this reason, it you know uh, uh, treatment is medically appropriate when it considers age and sex, and so it makes sense to treat them. Uh, demographics as, as target allowable. Uh, what about clinical status? So like comorbidity, again, the, uh, the clinical protocols, um, to the extent that they can often um, uh, stratify uh, um, protocols based on comorbidity, um, even um, uh, uh, protocols to uh, intensify treatment or not are, are based on a threshold uh, based on systolic blood pressure. So again, uh, having treatment decisions be clinically appropriate would argue that uh, clinical factors be treated as target allowable. Uh, socioeconomic status, this is a really interesting one um, uh, because uh, the treatment guidelines don't really base treatment decisions on um, the ability to pay or on socioeconomic status. Um, as, and so um, I would argue uh, that we should treat socioeconomic status as uh, as um, as as uh, non allowable, um, um, because um, if we didn't, um, you know, intervening to uh, remove racial differences in treatment intensification um, uh, would 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 sort of preserve differences that operate through racial differences in socioeconomic status. The intervention that we're thinking about would be inappropriate, not only clinically inappropriate, but also in inequitable. Um, the reason why I said this is an interesting case is because when you think about the social contract or the medical contract at play, it really allows you to make decisions based on age and sex and clinical factors. Um, even though our society, I would argue, has a contract that includes SES based on um, how uh, reimbursement systems operate and how payment systems operate. Um, and so uh, this really speaks to the notion of a, of a social contract being um, um, ideal, one that one believes how treatment should be ideally governed uh, rather than how it is actually governed in uh, society. Um, and so one final caveat uh, with um, target allowability um, is um, it is important to you know, think about the social contract in a broader context. So, uh, you know, there may be cases where everyone needs treatment, but treatment is scarce. Um, and so we could come up with criteria, say, for example, if we're looking at organ uh, uh, transplant decisions, um, you know, um, we could come up with criteria to, to that we thought were fail, that we thought were fair. So, for example, uh, whether or not uh, there's a donor match, um, et cetera. Um, but there actually might be disparities in those criteria. So maybe racial and ethnic minorities have uh, fewer matches available or, or live further from 
uh, treatment centers or have a lower social support. Um, and I think it's important to recognize that, you know, there are different ways of measuring disparities here. You know, you could measure disparities in the decision, in which case you'd want to treat the criteria as allowable. But if you're thinking more broadly about weights at the, at the population level, um, you could treat those criteria as non-allowable, um, particularly if the intervention you're thinking about would address disparities in those criteria. So just like with uh, thinking about allowability for outcomes, um, uh, or, or for goods that were our health outcomes, uh, or sorry, for thinking about uh, disparities in health outcomes, when we're thinking about disparities in um, goods, we, we can also think more broadly uh, for those as well when we think about uh, the criteria. Uh, so um, again, um, however we choose to define uh, allowability, um, for the purposes of the causal decomposition analysis, I'm proposing that we uh, first uh, stratify uh, by uh, the, those um, outcome allowables, which is say why additional uh, target allowable variables. Um, and, then, um, uh, and then simply our intervention here is to remove uh, differences within levels of these variables. So anything that we can consider to be outcome allowable is also target allowable. And then there may be additional variables that are target allowable. So for example, our, our outcome disparity might be um, defined in terms of age and sex, but the, the disparity in treatment intensification might also further be defined in terms of uh, clinical factors. Um, and the intervention here, you could formally think of it as like a random uh, draw of treatment intensification from the distribution that's among uh, whites um, who have uh, the same um, uh, age and sex and treatment intensive uh, and, 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 and clinical factors as, as Blacks. So we're moving racial disparities in treatment intensification uh, within levels of these factors. Um, and so with that, we can define our estimates. How would the hypertension control disparity change if uh, treatment intensification disparity was removed? Um, and you can see here that our, um, our estimate is really only defined in terms of the outcome allowables, say um, age and sex, but the intervention that's really defining this counterfactual scenario is defined within levels of things that are outcome allowable, so the age and sex, and also um, clinical status. Notice that um, socioeconomic status does not enter the scientific question that we're, we're asking here. Um, it doesn't define our outcome disparities, and it doesn't define how we're removing disparities because we deemed socioeconomic status to be non-allowable in both cases. Uh, so. Um, just as a reminder, you know, uh, suppose we were looking at um, demographics as outcome allowable, additional target allowables as clinical factors like blood pressure and diabetes. Um, and so the age and sex really defines our disparity measure, um, as well as our intervention. Additionally, blood pressure and diabetes further define our intervention. Um, but non allowable factors like socioeconomic status, like education and insurance, uh, neither define our disparity measure nor our, our intervention. Are there any questions? at this point? Okay, um, good, all right. Um, so hopefully that's good news. So um, now the question is, how do we take those um, estimates? And I, I promise I'll wrap up with enough time for questions. Um, so now the question is, um, how do we actually estimate you know, these quantities, right? So we have to link them to observed data. Uh, really briefly, um, we need some assumptions. We need some common support assumptions. We need some conditional exchangeability or no confounding assumptions, uh, positivity and consistency. Um, really quickly, we need uh, common support for the outcome allowables across race so that we can um, uh, balance age and sex. We also need another common support assumption for treatment intensification. So for those who have the same age and sex and clinical status, we need a form of overlap in the treatment intensification distribution so that we can shift the distribution that's found among blacks to where the distribution is among whites. Uh, and then we uh, need to be able to estimate the effect of treatment intensification on uh, hypertension control. And so um, the analysis, our, our estimates already to condition on age and sex and clinical factors. Um, so this is where we incorporate socioeconomic status um, to identify this effect. Uh, so it serves, it plays the role as a confounder 
um, but not as something that defines our scientific question. Um, and the idea here is that given the allowables and the non-allowables, um, we have no un, un, unmeasured confounding uh, uh, among blacks. And uh, we also need a positivity assumption, um, which is again, like an uh, overlap assumption. So, um, and we also need a consistency assumption, which is basically saying, you know, we're imagining an intervention, we only have observed data. Um, and so we assume that, um, you know, we could observe the same outcomes if we uh, intervene to intensify treatment versus just observing uh, someone having their treatment intensified. So with these assumptions, we can actually estimate um, our, 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 uh, our quantities here. So the observed disparity really just relies on those overlap assumptions and we can estimate it using a weighted difference in uh, hypertension control across blacks versus whites uh, using um, you know, uh, methods that we know and love. Uh, so inverse probability weighting here. Um, these are pretty much stabilized inverse probability weights uh, that only adjust for the outcome allowables. So the numerator here is the probability of um, belonging to the black group. Um, the denominator is um, the analogous probability, but conditional on um, uh, age and sex. And then we have a similar weight for, uh, for whites. Uh, again, where this is the probability of belonging to the white group, the denominator is uh, conditional on the outcome allowables, which includes age and sex. And we can um, estimate uh, the, the denominator um, using um, uh, um, a regression model, you could be fancier and use some sort of machine learning to get the predicted probabilities. But essentially you would you know, model uh, membership in, in, in the racial group um, conditional on the outcome allowables. To get the reduced disparity, we need a third weight. Um, and with that third weight, we could carry out a weighted difference across um, uh, blacks first using that stabilized inverse probability weight we just discussed. Um, and here we can use uh, what's called a ratio of mediator probability weighting, where the denominator is um, the probability of, of observing one's observed treatment intensification um, um, given um, uh, um, among Blacks, given the non allowables, which is socioeconomic status, target allowables, which is clinical factors, outcome allowables, which is age and sex. And then the numerator is um, uh, the probability of, a, of one's observed treatment intensification um, among the distribution found among whites, um, conditional on um, only on clinical factors and age and sex. So really conditional on the target and outcome allowable co covariates, not the non-allowables. So the non-allowables, SES only shows up in the denominator. You um, create this weight for blacks and you multiply it by their stabilized inverse probability weight. And you take this um, weighted uh, difference across um, blacks using first this weight and then second using this weight. And that tells you uh, once you take uh, um, uh, the uh, difference in weighted means there, you can estimate how much the disparity would change under that hypothetical intervention to remove disparities in treatment intensification. Uh, the reduced, uh, um, I think I already talked about this. So the residual disparity, oh, I'm just saying here that you can estimate these again from, 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 um, from models. Um, and so the, re the, the residual disparity is just comparing uh, that, that counterfactual estimate for blacks to the observed estimate for whites, which again, for whites is just using their uh, regular stabilized inverse probability weights that you calculate for the observed disparity. Um, so um, I'm about to wrap up, I only have like two or three more slides. Um, so, um, there are other estimators that people might use to answer these sorts of questions. Um, and that epidemiology is very popular to use uh, what are called natural indirect effects um, and more um, elegantly path specific effects. Uh, and in economics, um, if you talk to someone hands down, they'll tell you to do a Oaxaca blinder uh, decomposition. Um, and you know the problems is mostly with um, how they partition allowable and non-allowable covariates, um, and 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 how um, because it it can lead you to not respect certain ethical principles. So for natural indirect effect estimators, if you look at them closely, 
um, the quantity that they estimate is conditional on all covariates needed to identify the effect. So that means that the outcome disparity conditions on SES, which violates the principle of amenability to intervention, um, and it also and also um, it also conditions by having everything be conditional on um, all covariates. It also means that the intervention conditions on SES too, which violates social contract because because we said that medical decisions need to be medically appropriate, basing decisions on SES is arguably uh, not um, medically appropriate when it comes to decisions about whether or not to intensify someone's um, uh, antihypertensive treatment. Um, path specific effects um, don't condition everything on all covariates, but one version makes the intervention only depend on age and sex. So that would be like sending your, uh, your aunt or your uncle to the doctor and their decision to intensify treatment only depends on how old they are and what their uh, what the sex on their chart is listed as, which would be medically inappropriate. Um, so it ignores the social contract that we use in medicine, which is inappropriate. Um, uh, another version of a path-specific effect um, is similar, but instead it would condition the entire, uh, the, the intervention on uh, SES, which as I said with the indirect effects really um, is inappropriate because it would base treatment decisions on um, SES. And finally, the Oaxaca blinder decomposition estimators, um, it really depends on which form you're using, what the problem is. They both have problems in this example. Um, the, the linear one would really, uh, would not base the, the, the intervention on anything, which um, it would just be a random draw from, from um, which would be a random draw from the, the, the white distribution. Uh, so it'd be totally medically inappropriate um, the reweighting versions, which are really popular, those are the, the DiNardo, uh, um, the Mu and Fortin estimators. Um, and those ones, um, the way that you get to those estimators is by conditioning the intervention on um, all the covariates that you need to identify the effect. Um, again, that makes the treatment decisions conditional on socioeconomic status, which again, um, ignores what I think is the ideal social contract. Uh, so, um, you know, this is, I think my last uh, slide here. So, um, you know, we wanna identify targets for policies and interventions to reduce disparities. Causal inference can help us do this, but we have to be really clear how we define disparity, how we define intervention so that they reflect sensible equity value judgments. Um, often this is gonna lead to unique estimators, not ones that are off the shelf, um, and uh, the nice thing about uh, the, the ones that I propose in my paper is that they're adaptable to any choice you make. So even though I have my own sort of normative frame of how I think about these things, you're uh, free to use your own frame. What's nice is that it, it allows us all to be explicit about what we believe is equitable and fair and we can have conversations. Um, so another thing is um, the implications is that it um, helps you think about, you know, how are you going to design your study to measure covariates so that you can define disparity appropriately, both for outcomes and also for treatment decisions. Um, there's a lot of work to do. Um, so, you know, I'll, I'll be pretty busy um, working on practical examples to make this plain. Um, and that's all I have. Thank you so much for your time. Happy to take a couple questions. Um, and you can email me as well. Thank you. Thanks so much, John. Um, I've got a couple of questions, one in the chat, um, and it's from Stacy who asked, um, would you consider health insurance status as allowable or non-allowable? I would consider that as non-allowable. I would consider that as non-allowable. And then I have, a, 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 there's another question um, about, does your waiting procedure require overlap? Like what if one group has all the outcomes in one group are worse than all the outcomes in the other group? So you mean like overlap in the outcomes? Yes. Um, no, it doesn't require overlap in the outcomes. It requires overlap in the, in the intervention distribution uh, because the, the outcomes aren't modeled here at all. So um, there are um, 
cases, there, so there are other estimators where you can, instead of modeling the targets, so instead of modeling treatment intensification, you could model the outcomes, right? Um, but that would, that would require an overlap assumption for the outcomes. But here we're not modeling the outcomes at all. Um, the form of overlap that you need is that um, whatever variation you see uh, among whites, you need to also see that among blacks. It doesn't matter if you see certain variation among blacks that doesn't happen among whites because the intervention here is unidirectional. We're shifting the distribution for blacks to, to, to where it is among whites. Um, does that help? Yes. <laughs> okay, I'm happy to say more. I'm sorry if I didn't. I was just waiting for a yes from someone. Uh, I would, that, okay. that my pause was, um, yeah. Okay. Are there any other questions for, for Dr. Jackson? Yeah, so. I'm gonna, I unmuted Stacy, so I think she's got some follow-ups <laughs> that she wanted to. Yes, sorry, uh, John, that was fantastic. I just wanted uh, to follow up on the non-allowable health insurance status and also the beautiful way that you've shown us how you can incorporate um, these measures in different types of estimates with this approach. Um, because often what I find in, in my work is that even though typically we think about um, disparities and lower SES, meaning lower access to care through health insurance barriers, sometimes that ends up being a bit of an odd relationship. So where someone's very low income and maybe has very generous health insurance for certain services. So this is a fantastic way to think about incorporating that information and getting estimates that include it uh, specifically. So uh, thank you so much. This was such a great talk. Thank you, Stacey. Um, I, really, I really admire your work. And so to have praise from you, it's really uh, means a lot to me. Thank you. We, uh, we are at time, um, so I don't want to keep Dr. Jackson uh, any longer, but again, um, thank you so much for joining us today. I think everyone received, um, received learned a lot um, and, and got a lot of benefit out of your talk, so we really appreciate it. Um, and join us in two weeks um, for... Our next Grand Rounds with Dr. Michelle Marcus from the Department of Economics. Uh, invitations will go out soon. Thanks, guys. Thank you.